people think I'm damaged goods. I'm worried about losing my job. Will I ever get a transplant? I want to see my children graduate from college. How can I afford this? I don't want to be a burden. I'm afraid. I'm overwhelmed with information. Sometimes I wonder if I'll ever fall in love and get married. I just want to play with my friends. You're listening to Kidney Talk, streaming health, happiness, and hope to the renal community with your hosts, Lori Hartwell and Stephen First. Well, welcome to another uh, broadcast of Kidney Talk. Today, we have Dr. Leslie Wong. He's the Vice President of Clinical Affairs of Satellite. And uh, Dr. Wong and I have something in common. We're very passionate about home dialysis. And today, we're going to talk about the Alliance for Home Dialysis that's been created in this country to help move having home dialysis a little bit more available to patients and the community. So welcome to the show, Dr. Wong. Yeah, thank you, Lori. So tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your interest in why you became such an advocate for home dialysis. Yeah, sure. Well, I am uh, not that old, but uh, when I was in uh, training as a renal fellow, um, I learned uh, and uh, with great interest about problems that the country faced in terms of providing, you know, adequate treatment and rehabilitation for people with uh, kidney disease, uh, specifically those on dialysis. And one of the things that I, I learned was that home dialysis was a, really a great option for many people and could really help them kind of regain control over their lives and, and actually maintain their quality of life and, and, and whatnot. But then I was also kind of always struck by the statistics and the numbers that so uh, very few people, even though it's, it was available, were able to take advantage of, of doing home dialysis or uh, home treatment. So I kind of got interested very early on in my training. And then when I uh, got to Seattle, which had, you know, has a you know, great history in, in terms of dialysis, but also home dialysis, I really got to really learn about the history of home dialysis and, and just heard so many different stories of how things had developed over the years. And when I had the opportunity to become medical director of one of the home dialysis programs there, I really kind of was able to challenge all of these things that I felt were, you know, could be so helpful for people out there into my work. Well, you know, I'm a big advocate of home dialysis because I was on PD for nine years and I was on home hemo for six months. And, you know, home is always the best option. And, you know, I think it's really important to just explain to the audience maybe real quickly the two different types of home dialysis that's available. Yeah, absolutely. In general, there um, when people talk about home dialysis, it uh, includes two different uh, ways of doing it. Um, one is, uh, as you mentioned, is peritoneal dialysis. Um, that's a really simple procedure where there's a, a silicone tube or catheter that's placed in someone's uh, abdomen, and the, the end of the catheter actually sits inside your abdominal cavity. And dialysis solution, which is sterile, is is put into the person's body, and then it kind of I always kind of explain it kind of leaches out all the toxins, but it basically all of the toxins that are uh, in your blood actually diffuse or they kind of move into this fluid and that, uh, you know, like four times a day that fluid is actually drained and then replaced. So it's kind of like a, a kind of a natural way of, of using your body's own kind of abdominal cavity to cleanse your blood. And uh, that's really convenient for folks because uh, in between the time that they're actually, they call it exchanging the fluid that is putting it in and, and kind of draining it out, they're free to, to do their usual activities. And, and as, as in your example, people can uh, be very successful and do this for many years. The other kind of home dialysis is uh, probably closer to what most people think about when in terms of dialysis. It's, it's called home hemodialysis, and there is a, a small machine that actually can fit on your coffee table or a side table that the, the person and uh, either themselves or with help of a family member, they hook up to this machine and, um, and uh, it directly cleans their blood and removes fluids and whatnot. So kind of uh, a little bit different than peritoneal dialysis where you use your body's own kind of uh, blood vessels and abdominal cavity. The home hemodialysis relies on a, on a machine, although it's a small compact one, and that filters the blood and, uh, and, and helps people kind of uh, get treatment for their kidney disease. Well, being on both, there's, you know, peritoneal dialysis and um, home hemodialysis. I think 
probably my biggest fear is when with the home hemo, you have to stick yourself. And that seems to be one of, or you have to put needles in your arm. Either you have to do that or somebody else. Whereas in PD, there's no needles. It's it's just basically pouring solution in and out of you through a peritoneal catheter. So, I mean, I think, it, do you think that that's one of the barriers for patients going home is having to um, stick themselves? Yeah, I, I think a lot of times it's more of a perceived barrier than a than a real barrier. Uh, but but to, it, it certainly is an, an issue that we're very concerned about. Um, I think a lot of people, especially when they start dialysis, it's such. I mean, it, it is a life changing experience, and the prospect I think for many uh, patients and their families of actually. Um, I mean, a lot of people. I mean, you know. I, I'm just like everyone else. I, I get my flu shot every year, but I kind of cringe when that needle comes out. Um, <laughs> and normal. if you can imagine someone who's actually relying this for, you know, for life-saving treatment to then be faced with that responsibility of putting in needles into their own body to, to, to uh, perform the treatment. So I think that that, is, that, that truly is a, a barrier. Um, now, why I say it's a perceived barrier is that when you actually, once people start dialysis and they are trained and they learn how to actually cannulate or insert the needles into their fistula, and, and again, uh, uh, fistula is a, it is a blood vessel that is kind of modified surgically in your arm, uh, usually that allows you to insert needles repeatedly without um, doing a lot of, uh, to, to support the dialysis. Once people actually get comfortable and are trained doing it, it's actually not a big deal at all. And in fact, I've spoken, when I was in Seattle, I remember doing rounds in the home human dialysis training unit and seeing, you know, several patients that were like, boy, if I knew it was this easy, um, I, I would have done this so much earlier. But, uh, but, you know, again, it's one of those things, I think, trying to time all this stuff with the transition of, of, of starting dialysis uh, is, is a real barrier that needs to be overcome. Well, the friends that I have that are on home dialysis, they always say they feel so much better. So, um, once they get used to it and are able to adjust to, you know, what they need to do, their quality of life improves. So that's a big benefit if you can overcome some of those barriers. Well, tell us a little bit about why the Home Dialysis Alliance for Home Dialysis uh, uh, started and what are some of the goals? There was a lot of, you know, there has been a lot of interest, and particularly with the CMS bundle uh, a, few, a few years ago, about um, how to kind of get people together, uh, and not, you know, not just clinicians, but also patients, uh, people from uh, industry, people from, you know, uh, government agencies, you know, uh, how would we get all these different stakeholders together to uh, try to work collaboratively, uh, cooperatively to try to, you know, to get the message across that there are barriers to doing home dialysis, that there are so many benefits that are available to folks. And for one reason or the other, we have so few people able to take advantage of that. So there was a, a national summit on home dialysis policy, um, and uh, the first ever, um, that was held in March of 2012 in Washington, D.C. So, you know, you had people from all over the country, um, you know, very uh, respected, you know, researchers and doctors from, you know, uh, academic medical centers. You had people from the companies that actually make the machines and the solutions that people uh, use for home dialysis. You had people from, um, from uh, patient uh, advocacy groups, uh, people from, you know, CMS. I mean, they, they were just, a, a, you know, this huge room filled with everyone there because they all believe that home dialysis is um, underutilized, home dialysis is beneficial for patients, and, 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 and really to, to really get together and have a discussion about what steps and what kind of structural organization was needed to, you know, to, to, to really put forth a unified message to everyone. Um, so that's kind of, I think, what was one of the big conclusions from the summit. And then following that, I think because of the, the interest by so many people, this alliance actually was formed. Well, you know, I find it interesting in other countries, uh, many of the times the option for the patient is that you go on peritoneal dialysis you don't have another option. And I think it's interesting when I talk to different patients that, you know, if you're in Canada, they really, your first option is peritoneal. And if for some reason you can't do peritoneal, then other options are available to you. In the U.S., it seems to be the opposite, <laughs> that, you know, in-center hemo is the option, and you got to kind of work to get onto the other home treatments, and so the expectation is a little switched, I think, in the community, 
which is, you know, interesting. Well, what are some of the barriers? And, you know, the patients listening, I mean, I know one of the barriers that I had when I was, you know, I was on for a long time, and I was in my early 20s on PD, and I lived in a studio apartment. And um, luckily, I had a big porch out back that I could put a shed that I could put my supplies on. And I lived in Southern California, so I didn't have to worry about snow. Um one of the barriers I hear from some patients is just where do you put all the supplies? And, um, you know, some of the different things and how do we overcome some of these barriers? Perhaps maybe there's a way to get some assistance to have that patient move into another place where they could actually have room for the supplies. I don't know if that's doable, but has that been thought about? Yeah, I think one of the, um, you know, it's hard to, you know, to answer that for every single situation, but I, I know one of the things that um, um, that I think all home dialysis uh, units or programs do is that they'll, they'll do like a home visit. And what that is is that, you know, some people may actually think that, oh, my house is too small or, or, or my house is too messy or, or just how can I, you know, you know, uh, it's hard enough for me to figure out where I want to put this lamp. How can I think <laughs> about putting a home dialysis machine in my house? Um, but, but I think all home dialysis programs are very experienced uh, nurses and other folks that will come out to um, a, a patient in their family's home um, it, whether it's them just living alone or, or a group of people, and really kind of do an assessment. You know, in the old days, which wasn't that long ago, you know, there, there would actually have to be a, an assessment of the plumbing and whatnot because before they had the kind of compact dialysis machines, you actually had to have like a traditional dialysis machine in your home, which would require sometimes even changing the plumbing. And I think that was actually a, a big logistical hurdle. But now because the technology has gotten so much better, you know, again, as I mentioned before, a lot of these machines, and things they fit on they they fit on a, a side table. They're they're very compact. They're actually meant to travel, so you can actually put these in your, the trunk of your car. Or um, you know, I've seen uh, I've actually had some of my patients you know ask for the the little permission slip so they can actually cart this through the airport security and whatnot. So so the, so so things are much more compact. But um, so I think that you know it's one of those things where the the nurse and the the patient their family they kind of go over like okay what how would this actually work in my home and then they kind of make a decision i think there are some cases where you know someone's you know living in an extremely small uh living space or they don't actually have a place where they can perform the dialysis uh, in, pri- in privacy where it, it is an issue. But, but most of the time, people are able to find a way. Um, but I, I, I really appreciate that point. It is important to know what to expect. Well, I know when I was on um, peritoneal, I would go camping, and I would take all my supplies, my PD supplies, put them in the car, and then I would do an exchange in the car. And I think a lot of patients do this, but then I would just put the bag in the windshield so it would heat up. <laughs> and then you find all these different ways to, you know, I mean, and then, you know, I would do the exchange in the car, but the, the, the fluid would be nice and warm. And, and you know, it was kind of interesting because sometimes we'd have some really hot days in California. And I just wanted the bag just a little bit cooler because I needed to be cooled off. And so there was some advantages to being on peritoneal dialysis. You could always keep the temperature of your body the way you wanted by the solution going in it. <laughs> I don't know if I'd get in trouble with that with the doctor, but <laughs> yeah, I think most uh, the most doctor, uh, the nephrologist, and the nurse and, and, and PD uh, nurses will probably go. Well, you probably don't want to hang it on the window, but uh, but you know, I think if you walk into most home dialysis uh, units in the U.S., they always have. I, I've always been struck. So whether you're on the East Coast, West Coast, in the in the Midwest, wherever, you always walk in, and there's always a bulletin board, and you have you know people and their families sending in pictures, and so like you've got people that are doing. PD like at the Grand Canyon or doing home chemo on a trip. It's it, there's always really neat pictures. You know, a lot of people doing it in their RVs and whatnot. No, it's a you you can travel. That was one of the big advantages of being on home dialysis, not having to uh, schedule your treatment. Well, um, moving forward, I'm interested in some of the policy issues that are. Uh, preventing you know this therapy being more widespread. And can you uh, you know maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I mentioned uh, just a little bit ago about, you know, all the different uh, interested parties that got together and advocates that got together to form this alliance after the Home Dialysis Summit this uh, past spring. So there were like four 
basic areas that I think that the participants really uh, focused on during the summit, and I think this carries over to how, what the alliance is, how the alliance is organized. Number one, um, you know, it was recognized that there are just some very significant educational training and infrastructure challenges. So, you know, whether it's the doctor's office, the medical center, the dialysis provider, there are a lot of different things that uh, existed in terms of, uh, of education and training. The second thing was how um, kind of reimbursement and, and whatnot impacted the provision and availability of home dialysis. The third topic that was focused uh, upon was how regulatory measures and quality of care, how this all takes home dialysis into consideration because, by and large, most of the published public quality measures focus really on in-center dialysis and not as much on, on the home side, so that was recognized as an issue. And the last thing was in regards to innovation. You know, I think all of us in the medical community, and I think patients and families always appreciate that people are doing research, that we are not satisfied with the status quo, that we need something called innovation, that is, to find new technologies and new ways to uh, provide better care to folks. And so the, um, that was the last part of the discussion, how do we help each other negotiate this, you know, kind of, you know, huge area in terms of, of getting, you know, FDA approval for new medical devices and, and, and also uh, funding for research. So um, how the alliance was then organized is that uh, when the alliance was formed, many of the participants of the summit uh, joined and they formed a steering committee. I, I'm, I'm a member of the steering committee. And again, there are people from all different kind of backgrounds on this. But the steering committee oversees um, four uh, work groups. There's a work group that is focused on accessibility to home dialysis with the goal of raising awareness of all the different uh, barriers, such as physician education, patient education, training, infrastructure, uh, and then to, to really to, um, to identify these barriers and to promote policies and initiatives to address them. The second working group or work group is the accountability work group, and this is a group that is uh, focused on making sure that government programs and regulations recognize and support excellence in delivery and provision of home dialysis. That is, I mentioned just a bit ago that a lot of our um, focus in the dialysis world is really on in-center dialysis and not as much as home, so making sure that the government, that any regulations, anything that we have also applies or is made applicable to home dialysis to ensure that you know, the best quality of care is given to patients and their families. The third working group or work group is the innovation group. And again, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, this is this group is really focused on how to support and advocate for development of, uh, of better technology, therapies, practices, tools, et cetera, uh, to support patients at home uh, and their caregivers. And then the last work group deals with reimbursement, um, and that is to really monitor all the um, kind of the dizzying changes uh, in uh, dialysis reimbursement and to really, um, you know, look towards uh, policies that would support home dialysis and, and, you know, and get patient empowerment and whatnot. So that's kind of how, you know, from the, going from the summit with all these different issues, that's kind of uh, been a, a lot of the foundation of how the, the Home Dialysis Alliance is structured to address these basic issues. Well, I know one of the issues on reimbursement is that they don't um, adequately reimburse training of patients um, to go on home dialysis. So if a center invests in training a patient on home dialysis and then, you know, they go on home dialysis for a little while and then they don't stay on home dialysis, it's really difficult to justify it because it, they have to be on home dialysis for a while to justify the cost of the training. Correct. And so one of the initiatives is is to have CMS recognize that they need to um, increase the reimbursement for training of home dialysis patients, which would help the centers be able to provide it. Uh, when you talk about innovation, it's pretty interesting because um, when I was I was the first child to go on peritoneal dialysis back in 1980, and the equipment they used at the time was basically a IV tubing with the spike connector, yeah. <laughs> and it was all very primitive. And you know, you had the spiked connector with the bag, and you could not disconnect the bag. You had to keep the bag with you all the time. And, you know, you use betadine and gauze to wrap around the spike area. And, you know, to see how far the innovation has come 
to where, you know, you have the snap caps and you can adjust it. And, you know, peritonitis is a much lesser risk because back then when you had a spike technique and just gauze to, to protect that site, uh, peritonitis was a little bit more prevalent. <laughs> so, so that, you know, I've seen the innovation happen and it's so important that we continue the innovation and, you know, hopefully someday, one day I would love to see some type of, you know, you have one bag of like 1.5, uh, 2.5 and 4.25, but just have one bag and you like, you know, pop a bag or something and make it a higher strength bag. So you don't have to have so many different types of bags. Oh, absolutely. I, I would love to see that innovation. So you have, um, you know, 30, 1.5 bags and, you know, you can make any of them a 2.5 or a 4.25, which would really help on storage. So I hope somebody's working on that out there. Well, I, I think one of the things that's important to mention as well in terms of innovation is that, you know, I think people tend to, um, you, you know, it's, it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll get a fancier machine or, or something like that. But some, some of the best innovation is actually simplifying things. How can you actually make you know some of the delivery systems whether you know, something as simple as tubing and I think you I think that's a great example you know um, years ago when patients that people that were doing perineal dialysis actually had to connect the bags manually there was a much higher risk of infection we actually had to, you know data to show that with you know simple improvements of, of of just the plastic tubing you know the the rates of infection have have, have very much decreased. And so it's really kind of, you know, make, you know, if we can be smart and thoughtful about the technology, not necessarily putting more bells and whistles, but making it really accessible uh, for people to use, I think that's key. The other thing that I think uh, doesn't get talked about enough is kind of our delivery of care as a means of innovation. So, you know, I mentioned earlier in our interview about just how tough it is for people to make that transition, you know, from uh, just from uh, chronic kidney disease to being a dialysis patient. And so, you know, we don't always have the infrastructure or the care delivery system set up to facilitate that. So it's almost kind of like I always, you know, we, we talk about the, a frequent example that happens in the United States. Someone who has, say, you know, fairly significant kidney disease but not really needing dialysis yet gets hospitalized for a completely unrelated reason. Maybe they have, uh, they're in a car accident or, or they have a pneumonia or something happens and then they have an injury to their kidneys and then now they're on dialysis. Well, it, it's almost kind of like the doctors, the nurses, the hospital feels happy when the, you know, that patient is actually gets better and survives, now is, relies on dialysis and gets discharged home. But you know, that's not really a, uh, that's only a partial victory because really the road is just starting at that point and, and really kind of maybe thinking in an innovative manner about how we help people with that transition and make sure that they get care, the care they need along, you know, different parts of the path. Well, yeah, it's hard to make a decision when you're in denial. <laughs> and I know if, uh, when your kidneys fail and you need dialysis, you're in denial. So it's hard to make a, the right decision until you pass through all the emotional stages. Well, um, uh, Dr. Wong, um, it's been great talking to to you. Can you tell us a little bit more about if people want to find out about the Alliance? And uh, one thing that I find really interesting is that, you know, when I was on peritoneal dialysis, is I was always giving suggestions on how to improve the treatment. And I remember talking to some of the people who were at Baxter at the time, who was kind of a leader in PD when I started, Travanol, all these names that go back, Travanol. And um, but I would write in or I would tell them suggestions. Can you change the color of the clamp from white to a different color because it's harder to see and different things that I would suggest all the time. And I think if we can empower more patients to say, look, this is how I think the, the system could be better, that would really help propel innovation because the people using it know how to make the system better in addition to the clinicians. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so if, if anyone's actually interested, and I encourage people to look up the website, it's www.homedialysisalliance.org. I think you can probably Google it just as easily and find it. But there, there's information kind of recapitulating some of the uh, the facts that I that, that I shared with you a little while ago. But there's also a listing of the different groups that are involved. I think there's a way to email uh, the staff with questions and whatnot. I think I think again, there's so many different ways that this information can be shared. But the one thing I think that is really advantageous to have 
kind of a central group with this is that, you know, we have such broad representation. So it's not just the manufacturers. It's not just the medical, you know, the, the uh, academic medical centers. It's not, you know, it's, it's got, it's, there's patients, there's everyone kind of involved. So, so getting some of these things, I guess, to the right sounding board is, is important. Yes. A round table with all the stakeholders, you know, that's really how change happens. And it's really exciting because I think everybody should really consider home dialysis. Um, I know a lot of people out there like, I'm just going to get a transplant. And, you know, I, I don't have to worry about this. And I always remind them, well, if home dialysis or nocturnal in center, anything that's longer is is better for you. And, you know, you need to be as healthy as possible when you go for transplant. And that seems to resonate because, you know, we all think we're going to get a transplant really soon. And unfortunately, it doesn't always happen on our timeline. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, just to, you know, I think that the, 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 the central tenet, which is true for many things, is that we're so much stronger together than we are alone, and we yes. don't have to be alone, so let's do it together. Let's do it together. Well, that sounds wonderful. Well, Dr. Wong, thank you so much for helping share the information about the Alliance for Home Dialysis. I know RSN participates, and we're really excited to see what change we can put forth in the community. Wonderful. It was such a pleasure talking with you, Lori, and uh, it's been a great show. Thank you. We can control our own destiny. We can take charge of our health and ask questions about our medical options. We can form partnerships with our health care team. We can take steps towards self-improvement. We can be sensitive to the impact of our disease on our family. We can sing, dance, laugh, and enjoy our lives. We can appreciate today and look forward to tomorrow. We can help and support our fellow patients. We can pursue our hopes and dreams. We can make a difference. 